everyone. Let's quickly recap dynamics. The last week, week 13, with a little voice I have left, unfortunately. I cannot speak much louder and I hope you guys can hear me. What we discussed this week was in particular linear momentum balance in all its forms. We'd seen that the global version that we usually use, there's nothing else of course but mass, times acceleration equals sum of all external forces, and we discussed how this applies not only to entire bodies, but also to sub-bodies. And that in particular means if you cut something in half or open, you introduce inner forces, that relation must hold for each sub-body. The mass is that of the sub-body, that's the acceleration of the center of mass of the sub-body, and these are the all forces externally applied to the sub-body. Now, we discussed that there's also a local version for this which means if we don't look at a whole body, but we zoom into just one point inside a, uh, a solid, inside a body, then this uh, reduced to the following, the divergence of sigma, the stress tensor, plus the body force vector equals mass density times acceleration. And in particular, what we have then discussed is how we can reduce this to a 1D setting. Sorry, I'm trying to pen here. If we look at a 1D rod, And this simplifies tremendously, and it simplifies to the wave equation, which we know as the second derivative of u with respect to position equals c squared times u double dot. Where what we do here is we specialize to a 1D rod, which looks something like this. What we consider here is only longitudinal motion. So each point can move to the right by a function u of x and t. We use the displacement field, and we assume that there are no body forces. Oh, sorry, equals zero. This is the 1D wave equation that we write in this particular scenario. And the C, which we have in here, is nothing else but the longitudinal wave speed, which we saw was the square root of E, Young's modulus over rho. And this tells us how waves propagate in the 1D fashion inside such a solid. But we've made the nice analogy, if this is longitudinal motion, then we arrive at pretty much the same equation if we consider torsional motion. So we take a bar and we twist it. And in that particular case, we use the twist angle theta as the unknown, function of x and t. And then the equation looked like this, theta comma x, x equals a new wave speed, ct squared times theta dot dot, where the dots are second derivatives in time, of course. And this new wave speed we see here was nothing else but the square root of g, the shear modulus, divided by the mass density rho. And these are the longitudinal and the shear wave speed that we see here in this scenario. Now, these are the most general forms for traveling wave. We looked at a particular a vibrational motion of solids. So assume that you have a rod and you don't excite it you know, by external forcing so that you see waves travel through one at a time, but we essentially assume that the thing is vibrating freely with some honor conditions. You take a rod and you look at how it vibrates, if you know, it's hit once and then it goes into some sort of eigenfrequency, eigenmode vibration, just like the systems of particles we discussed before. And what we wanted to know are what are the eigenfrequencies and the eigenmodes of these continuous bodies vibrating. And we had seen that this corresponds nothing else the, to but the general solution of what we call standing waves. And the general solution of these vibrations of elastic rods, they look like this. For example, for the longitudinal case, the u of x and t was shown to be decomposed in a separable form. u hat of x times some function q of t looks like that. Where now this u hat we derived, we can just look this up in the formula collection, this u hat of x is given by some constant times the cosine of omega over c times x with a constant omega plus the second coefficient b2 times the sine of omega over c times x. This is the case for longitudinal motion. And the q of t here is the time dependent part. Note that this depends only on x, this only on time. This was given by constant a1 times the cosine of omega t plus a2 times the sine of omega t. And here we can see quite nicely that omega is now nothing else but the eigenfrequency. And if we want to interpret this graphically, what this means is the following. We have now a standing wave, 
And if I wanted to plot this u of x and t, if I fix a particular time t, that means I'm only plotting this first term, this function over here, with some constant multiplied by it, this is nothing else but a function of x, which gives what we call the mode shape. For example, if you have a beam which is fixed here and fixed there, a possible mode shape might look like that. Right? And now, this function is being multiplied by the time-dependent part, which means the amplitude of this will change over time. For example, at the next time, it may look something like this. If this thing goes negative, it may then look something like that. It's even more negative, something like that. So the magnitude of this will change, but the overall shape is not changing, which is why this thing over here is nothing else but our mode shape, our eigenmode, that we have to find. And these omegas that we see here, they tell us how quickly this thing turns upside down. These are nothing else but the eigenfrequencies that we're interested in in addition. Now the question is, how do we find those? And so what we need there usually is boundary conditions, which I always abbreviate as BCs, not British Columbia, or before Christ, boundary conditions. So in this particular case, where I said, okay, let's take a 1D beam, and let's say it's fixed at the beginning and at the end, this means that these two points cannot move in my 1D scenario here, which means I know that, in this case, for example, U of 0 is 0, and u at the other end, let's call this L, is the length of the beam is zero. And because they have to be zero for all times, that means not only u have to be zero, but especially this u hat has to be zero. And these are two conditions which I can apply to this thing over here. This gives me a linear system of equations in B1 and B2. Of course, the trivial solution for this would be that both b's are zero, but it's boring. It just means no motion at all. But there's always a non-trivial solution. And the non-trivial solution comes from writing these two in matrix form. When we write them in matrix form, we can write them as something times b1, b2, and in this particular case equals zero. And the non-trivial solution to this means that this thing here in front must have determinant of zero. That's what we need to enforce. When we solve that, this thing doesn't depend on the b's anymore, so the only unknown we have in here is omega. Right? We evaluated this at particular points of x. c is known. So what we have to do then is solve for omega. And as we've seen in class, there's always not just one omega, but in general there's infinitely many. Because what you'll end up with is some equation with cosines and sines. We know that they're two pi periodic, so there are usually infinitely many solutions. Omega 1, omega 2, all the way up to infinity. And these are the eigenfrequencies. The lowest is what we call again, like before, the fundamental frequency. Right. And once we have those, uh, we then, from this system of equations, also obtain the b1s and b2s as the eigenvectors corresponding to these omegas. And then we have the b's, we have the omega, which means we know what the mode shapes look like, which is the things I was plotting up here. And then the only thing we need is this Q of t, which comes with two unknowns, but these two ones we can find from the initial conditions, because we should also know where the bar is at the beginning of the investigation. Now, there are two quick things to note. These points over here, at which my u is zero, these are called the nodes. And these are points where the bar is not allowed to move or where it happens to not move. So in this case, we need to have u zero at both ends. These are nodes for sure, and depending on the mode, there could also be more nodes inside. If you had a free end, that means there cannot be any force. We showed in class that this means that at this point, not u needs to be zero, but it's slope. So if this was a free end, if this wasn't here, then the mode shapes could look something like that, where here you have a zero slope. Okay. And so this, of course, is the case of 1D longitudinal motion. We showed that in torsion, the ball is the same which is why we conclude what I call the torsion longitudinal analogy. Oops, longitudinal analogy. And this simply means that if you want to use the same setup for torsion, these two are really one-to-one -one the same. There's no need to resolve anything. If you treat a 1D bar in longitudinal motion or in, in torsional motion, you can reuse all the solutions. The only thing you have to do is you have to swap your u's against thetas. And so u everywhere becomes theta. 
and that of course also means in the heads. And the other thing you need to do is you need to swap the wave speed against the torsional wave speed. But other than that, everything you derive for longitudinal motion can also be applied to torsional motion just like that. And the last thing I want to mention is that, of course, oops, we can also do the same for bending. We didn't treat this in great detail in class, and you will also not find this on the exercises, and therefore most likely not on the exam. But in bending, we showed that the wave equation becomes a bit more complicated, because for the deflection, uh, the deflection, the motion transfers to the beam's axis, W, the partial differential equation we have to solve is of fourth order and it looks like that, where EI stems from the rigidity of the beam against deflection, against bending. This is what we have to solve in this particular case because here, this is fourth order in space, surely we can again use a separable solution, so this deflection can be written as some w hat of x times q of t, just like before. But here it becomes a little bit more tricky because this fourth derivative implies that we will have four unknowns here, b1 through b4, and that means that the system of equations we're getting here is larger. We need four conditions, essentially. And that's why if you have a beam, you usually have two boundary conditions at each end. If it's clamped, for example, you're suppressing not only the deflection, but also its derivative. If it's a free end, we know that both the torque and the force are zero. So that you have a set of four boundary conditions from which you can again do the same procedure. Write it as a linear system of equations in the unknown coefficients. Use a non-trivial solution to say the determinant of this has to be zero, and from that we obtain the eigenfrequencies. If you plug any of those back in, then this eigenvalue problem determines also the unknown coefficients, and then the initial conditions give us the last thingy down here. Again, note that we have infinitely many of these frequencies. The lowest ones, the lowest non-zero one, is what we usually call the fundamental frequency. Of course, if you have a bar which is free-free, completely free, then there's also rigid body motion. And this, like before, would reflect in terms of a zero eigenfrequency that should show up. That's essentially it. That's all we discussed in week 13 in dynamics. Thanks and ciao.